the Steel Ranger Mayor stepped through the door on the far end of the bathroom and opened up with a grenade machine gun of her own, blowing up the stalls and toilets between me and her. He washed over me, searing my lungs. Shrapnel cut into my armor and flesh, leaving me bleeding from a dozen small wounds. Outside, Calamity and Zenith crouched behind a row of lockers, which I had floated into a barricade. We were getting close to the school where I had once taken my cutie mark aptitude test, and the place was swarming with steel rangers. I was out of ammunition for little Macintosh, and was actually beginning to run low for the zebra rifle. We had been lucky taking them on one or two at a time, the element of surprise on our side. But now, they were alert and moving against us in force. Only the narrow hallway prevented us from being surrounded or utterly overwhelmed. A missile flew over the lockers, exploding against the wall behind Zenith and Calamity. The explosion blew both of them hard into the barricade. Calamity rose up, dazed and bleeding. Zenith didn't get up at all. Steel hooves! Velvet! I cried out. We need your help! The two of them were guarding our rear, Velvet considerably worse for wear, even after downing both of our remaining extra strength and restoration potions. She needed to stay out of heavy fighting, but we couldn't spare her entirely. The further in we got into the stable, the more ways to flank us opened up. Another thunderous explosion sounded from somewhere deep in the stable, followed by more. Water sprayed from all the damaged toilets. The Steel Ranger's hoofsteps splashed as she approached closer. Give it up, little pip. Crap. Surrender now, and the other blueberry saber might just spare you and most of your friends. You won't get that offer from Nova Rage. Yeah, that was going to happen. I don't suppose I can talk you into surrendering to us, I called back. Is mass murder really the Earth Pony way? Fuck you, she retorted, and opened up with another barrage of grenades. I wrapped all the debris around me in telekinesis and pulled them together, creating a shield. It didn't work very well. The first explosion blew the debris out of my magic's grasp, pummeling me with it. I felt bones break as pain surged through my body. More grenades detonated around me. My pipbuck screamed as every limb registered as crippled. My pipbuck politely told me that I was dying from internal injuries. I couldn't feel them. My body was in shock. All I could feel was cold. Two missiles streaked through the air overhead, entering the room behind me. They hit a steel ranger, blowing her off her hooves. She slid across the wet floor and collapsed in the corner, unmoving. Little Pip! Velvet Remedy cried out from forever away. I lost consciousness. My eyes blinked open. I couldn't feel my body, but somehow, I was still alive. My EFS was reading my condition as bad, but stable. I was looking up. I could see the lights of Stable 2 overhead. Heard their ever-present buzz. Where am I? Really, little Pip, Velvet Remedy chided kindly. With your habits of gross injury, you can't tell me you don't recognize Stable 2's clinic? Calamity? Zenith? Velvet Remedy's face leaned into view. The good news is that all three of you are going to survive reclaiming this floor. The bad news is that I've used up all our medical supplies and an unhealthy portion of the stables to save you. She glanced away. A few of Zenith's brews, too. Elder Blueberry Saber had pulled most of her ponies back into the apple orchard, Stulev said. She's worried now, and with good cause. She's worried? They nearly killed us, and we were now somewhere near, or nowhere near the Overmare's wing yet. I didn't understand why they weren't just swarming us and wiping us out. I said as much. Because there are less of them, and probably more of us. Still have said bluntly. About a fifth of the rangers she was leading didn't take too well to what was going on down there. Star Paladin Nova Rage killed one of them for disloyalty, 
and Elder Blueberry Saber locked away the rest of the disorderlies behind a welded door. Explained why diplomacy hadn't been working. All the ponies that diplomacy might have worked on, the Elder had locked up. They're trapped in the school, Velvet interrupted. Stewards was speaking with them. If we can get them out, we'll have nearly a dozen rangers on our side. Unfortunately, we're having a bit of trouble with that. But Elder Blueberry Saber doesn't know that. As far as she knows, the moment we took this section, we got a whole lot stronger. I tried to get up, only to realize that not only could I not feel the pain, I couldn't feel anything. Velvet Remedy had used her anesthetic spell on me. I tried to get up, fervently, sending signals to my brain, or from my brain to my body, and I couldn't sense that I ought to make a move. My body heaved, and I fell to the floor with a thud, bloodying my nose. I couldn't feel it either. Now look who's a silly pony, Velvet Remedy giggled. Stop that. Or, I'll tell homage that you're into bondage and spankings. I could feel myself blushing. I, mean, I couldn't feel it, but I'm sure I was. As extra punishment, Velvet let me lay there on the floor as she turned her attention to Zenith. The zebra was still unconscious. Calamity trotted in a short time later. I'm afraid there ain't an easy way to get that door open. Best bet's to cut through it with a blowtorch, and that'll take hours, he whined. On the plus side, seems like that's what the enemy is trying to do with the S and O wing. Only those doors are a hell of a lot thicker, and there's more than one of them. Best bet, we've still got a couple hours before they're through. I forced my body to roll over, feeling an uneasy sense of accomplishment when I managed it on the third try. I found myself staring up at the ceiling, rather than on my friends, which significantly diminished the victory. You know, magical energy weapons could melt through those doors a whole heap of a lot quicker. Steel Ranger's battle saddles aren't equipped with, with magical energy weapons, Steel Hooves replied. That's an enclave design. Yeah, said Calamity, in an odd tone. That's what I figured. My gaze fell on the grate of the air ducts. Unfortunately, while I was small, I was no chimera. I couldn't fit through them, but... Pyrolite! Was that little Pip? Calamity asked. Pyrolite can get through the air ducts. She can carry a blowtorch to the good guy steel rangers trapped inside the classroom. Let them cut their own way out, I suggested. Plus... She can carry in food and water to them for while they work. I like it, Calamity said, the grin I couldn't see evident in his voice. Frees us up to continue the mission while we're still providing diplomatic relief. We had a plan. So did Elder Blueberry Saber. While we were busy, the bitch had welded shut every entrance into the atrium except for the passage through the apple orchard. The orchard was a huge, open space with only thin trees for nearly useless cover. She could amass her forces inside, creating a kill zone while a few of her soldiers worked on cutting through the security doors. The best plan I could come up with was to float more lockers in front of us, forming a wedge of two lockers deep and two lockers high. Steelers and Calamity were going to join me, Velvet had clearly taken far better care of us than of herself, unwilling to use up more than the minimum medical supplies on herself that we might have, and did, need later. She was still partially crippled from the gunshot wound, and I insisted that she stay behind as a liaison with Pyrelite. Zenith promised Calamity that she would stand guard over our wounded medical pony. To claim that I was in good shape would have been an outright lie. But the pain I was in when the spell wore off was not the worst I had felt. Definitely better than being set on fire by a dragon or bucked between the thighs by a scary strong raider. 
I could work through it. My legs, fore and hind, all seem to work fine. If stiffly. And could breathe without too much effort. And I could feel my heartbeat. Plus, I had my magic and my pit buck. I was not in optimal fighting shape. But I didn't really need more. And there were ponies counting on me. I'd already seen too many ponies whom I recognized lying dead on the stable floor. I wouldn't allow Elderberry, Elder Blueberry Saber or Star Paladin Nova Rage to add to that number. Steelers trotted up behind me as I floated the lockers in a formation. A moment later, another Steel Ranger trotted up. Only, it wasn't a Steel Ranger. It was Calamity, wearing a Steel Ranger's armor from the neck back. His Desperado hat was still firmly on his orange mane, and he had Spitfire's thunder in his mouth. What are you doing wearing that armor? Steelhoofs demanded. Calamity just gave him a look. Okay, then how do you ex expect to fight in that? Magically powered armor requires months of training to perform even adequately in. What, me? Calamity mouth threw his grip on his anti-machine rifle. I shook my head, sending up a prayer to Luna for our coming battle and a prayer to Celestia to keep Zenith and Velvet Remedy safe. I telekinetically triggered the door. My brilliant battle strategy lasted about two minutes. Like the debris before, my magic couldn't hold the lockers against the explosive force of their missiles and grenades. I was forced to plant our barricade in the ground, creating a makeshift pillbox about 20 yards into the orchard. The Steel Rangers quickly surrounded us, firing into the lockers, slowly tearing away at our shields. Our line of sight was limited to a small crack between the lockers, purposefully not large enough to allow grenades. Even so, I had focused my magic on flinging all grenades back at our attackers until they stopped trying that. The gaps were too small for steel hoops to fire through. Calamity was still using Spitfire's Thunder to great effect, downing a steel ranger every time one was foolish enough to make herself or himself visible. The noise was deafening in our metal cage. My ears were ringing so badly, I felt I would vomit, but I stayed on task. But the Pegasus was down to less than half a dozen rounds of the rare ammo, even after, after pilfering some of the battle saddles of the anti-machine rifle ranger in the saloon. And the twin minigun battle saddle integrated into his armor couldn't be aimed through the tiny cracks. The zebra rifle was out of armor-piercing bullets, and the normal sword didn't have the penetrating power to take down a steel ranger. I was using my sniper rifle now. It too was out of armor-piercing ammo, but a well-placed shot to a weaker part of their armor would still go through. Part of me felt bad that I had become so practiced at defeating Applejack's creation. Calamity and I kept firing. Son of a... Calamity mouthed as he fired a final shot. He mentioned to me that he was out of ammo. My hope that had been we could take out enough of them to make a move again, an option. From all the red lights on my EFS, we had done admirably, but we were still doomed. I had walked us into a trap with yet another stupid plan, and this time I had probably gotten us all killed. I wasn't ready to give up just yet. It was about time to try a rush and gallop. Steelers and Calamity still had their battle saddles, and for the first time, the one putting that in danger of running out of ammo was our ghoul. Finally, being willing to, willing to scavenge ammo helped immensely. I focused, floating the lockers, and hurled them in all directions, aiming at the red marks on my EFS compass. There wasn't a lot of force behind the throw, but I released them just before they hit, and suddenly they went flying from file went from flying weightless lockers to flying heavy damned lockers. A chorus of thuds rang out as several Steel Rangers were clobbered and trapped underneath. Unfortunately, Steel Ranger armor made them strong. 
they began to buck the middle weights off faster than I had expected. We took off at a gallop, running across the orchard for the opposite door. Gunfire and explosions erupted all around us. Dirt and wood filled the air. A missile roared past me, disappearing into the foliage of an apple tree before exploding. I felt applesauce spatter in my face. Steelers fired towards the clearing, away ahead. Calamity bemoaned the magical powered armor's lack of wings, spun, and poured out suppressive fire behind us. Several Steel Rangers fired back with light machine guns and miniguns, but their shots glanced off the power armor he was wearing. Calamity swiftly turned, racing to catch up before one of them returned his fire with a missile or sniper round. He was doing far better in the suit than Steelhoofs had anticipated, but nowhere near as well as Calamity himself had expected. Still, it looked like we would make it. I pushed as far as my battle-weakened and overstrained body would take me, and I was the first to reach the door. It was locked and trapped. Of course. But this was not a problem for me. Well, not one of my skill or tools. It was a problem of time. Calamity and Steelhoofs reached me as I attempted to disarm the explosive. Steelhoofs had began to guide me through it, his skills far surpassing my own, while Calamity turned to face the approaching rangers. Give it up, called out Elder Blueberry Saber as the Steel Rangers advanced, encircling us. I heard a click as the bomb disarmed. Now for the door. I heard more clicks as every enemy Steel Ranger in the Apple Orchard reloaded. Blueberry Saber called out to us again. Last chance. Give it up. I sighed. Damn it. This was the damn Ministry of Morale. Rooftop. All over again. Why don't you just kill us? Because now she needs to make an example of me, Steelers guessed. And she knows that will go a lot smoother if she has hostages I care about. Or maybe I just need a good lock picker, Blueberry Saber answered. Some pony who can get me past a security door. Oh, hell no. A deep explosion rang out. One of the Steel Rangers fell. Her midsection torn through. Several friendly lights suddenly danced across my EFS compass. But that was impossible, I thought. The Steel Rangers upstairs were still hours away from being freed. We wouldn't be getting reinforcements for... A magical energy pistol appeared, pointed at Blueberry Saber's head. It was held by a familiar looking griffin, the hood of her cloak falling back to reveal her head. Blackwing? Elder Blueberry Saber's eyes went wide as she realized the situation had dramatically changed. What? Where did you come from? Blackwing smirked as she pulled the trigger. The green beam from her pistol striking the pony between their eyes, turning her into a pony-shaped glow of luminescent green. Gawad sent me. Elder Blueberry Saber collapsed into a luminescent puddle. The battle had changed. Arcs of magical energy from the small group of griffins were exchanged with the artillery fire of the Steel Rangers. Calamity and Steelhooves waded into the fight while I struggled to unlock the door with my telekinesis. The door unlocked with a satisfying click and slid open. Beyond, I could see the atrium. But before I could see it, I could smell it. The cloying stench of burnt pony hair and the reek of spilled blood pooling and drying by the gallons, smashed into me like a speeding wall. This room had become a slaughterhouse. Colorful, innocent ponies lay dead everywhere. In many cases, the same ponies could be seen in multiple places. One of the Steel Rangers had unleashed a grenade minigun in the room. I stepped into the atrium, over a pink leg blown off at the knee. I saw a yellowish clump of matter sliding down a wall, mixed with blood. It took me a moment to realize it wasn't part of a pony's brains. It was cake. I looked up 
and saw the colorful banner. The Steel Rangers had interrupted a cutie mark party. I felt rage. Pure, unadulterated rage. I met three Steel Rangers on the atrium balcony at the top of the stairs. Two of them were wielding auto axes and were working their way through the third and final security door. They had about half an hour's work left to go. I wrapped each of them in magic, floating them up and turning them towards each other before they could react and turn the auto axes off. The magically enhanced blades did exactly what they were designed to do, cut through metal. The flesh beneath offered no resistance at all. It was a gruesome mess. I dropped them, but kept the auto axes, turning to face the last of the Steel Rangers. Star Paladin Nova Rage, I presume. I noted her battle saddle had a grenade machine gun. The Star Paladin stared at me. Yes, and you are? Run. The adrenaline had once again left my body, and I hurt, physically and emotionally. It was literally all I could do to stand up. I had exercised my rage, but that left only despair and a deep sadness. The hour was long over, the blackest hour whose name I couldn't remember, where the darkness of the world is echoed most heavily by the darkness in the soul. But I was still trapped there. Blackwing joined me as I waited for Velvet Remedy and Zenith. The Overmare had surely been watching everything through the stable's friendly pie observation system, but she had not yet opened the door. God knows you've flown to our aid without contract. Content to negotiate compensation after the fact, the Griffin explained. When we heard the distress signal, she decided to give you the benefit of the doubt and ask my talons if we'd be willing to help. I'm thankful you said yes, I replied with a grim smile. My gaze kept drifting to the gaily colored, happy Cutsinera banner. Calamity trotted out, flexing his wings, thankful to be out of the Steel Ranger's armor. I do not envy Steel Hooves. He looked up. How in the hell did you appear right next to the Elder like that? Stealth Buck? Zenith trotted up to the steps of the atrium balcony. She stopped abruptly upon seeing Blackwing. Velvet Remedy collided with her backside and stumbled with a moan. She was crying again. Calamity flew to her wrapping her in one of his wings as she moved over the balcony. My girls had to make do with stealth bucks, yes. But I... Where did you get that cloak? Zenith interrupted. Blackwing gave the zebra a tolerant smirk. Yes, as I was saying, zebra stealth cloak. She fixed me with a serious look. You have more friends than I thought, kid. We barely made it past New Appaloosa when this Pegasus ghoul and her kid flagged us down. Turns out, they'd heard the distress signal too and wanted to pitch in. Practically gave us enough stealth bucks to get in while all you ponies were busy with the star spawn and wage war, wage war of our own. Not to mention the cloak, which, I should note, I insisted on paying her for. I looked over the railing at the other griffins in Blackwing's talons. The deep expression or explosions I had heard from before were now obviously from Butcher's little Gilda. I think she wanted to come in herself, but, well, she has a kid. A frown passed across Blackwing's beak, whom I'm really hoping is she's adopted, because if not, you. Sorry we didn't get to you sooner, Butcher call up, up to us. Managed to get ourselves trapped in the generator room for the longest time. But then you ponies came along, and not only take out the guard sealing us in, but most of the door, too. I was standing in an arbitrary that had once been my home, and yet I found myself laughing. It was not a good laugh. It was a hurting, 
horrified, emotionally wrung out laugh. The laugh of a pony that can't scream or cry. I forced myself to stop as the security door slid open. The overmare stood there, gazing at us. Behind her was a throng of terrified ponies. Is it safe? One of them asked. I found that I couldn't find my voice. I was petrified. Yep, Calamity answered for us. Rooted out the last of them. The ones in the school are the good ponies who just got wrapped up in something really horribly bad. They'll be leaving soon with us. The auto axes were making cutting through the wielding door a much quicker task. Thank you, the Overmare said to all of us. Then she stood, or shooed the other ponies back inside. They did not need to see any more of what had become of the atrium. Little Pip, Velvet Remedy, would you please come in? The Overmare motioned for us to enter the formerly sealed wing. Clemity slid his wing from Velvet and poked her towards the Overmare with his nose. She moved slowly, but with ladylike grace. I followed, feeling clumsy and small and horrible. And then there was blood everywhere. Sparkling Cider did a wave with his hoof like this and fell down. As the Overmare guided us through the crowd towards her office, a familiar voice froze me in place. Mother? I looked up, and there she was, standing in a small clique of friends, notably absent Mrs. Sparkle Cider. She turned and looked at me with a vaguely scandalized expression. Is that little Pip? She asked one of her friends. The other mayor answered in the affirmative. I don't even recognize her, Mother said, not with awe or maliciousness, but as a casual statement of truth. I felt all the life drain from me as she looked me over. My blood had turned into ice water. My stomach knotted up, and then sank into the lowest part of my body it could find. The world seemed to stretch away from me. She turned away from me, delving back into her conversation, my presence barely augmenting her tale. I was traumatized. I mean, I'm going to have nightmares of this forever. I'm going to need therapy. And as possible, horrible as this sounds, my first thought was that will never come out of this apron. Because he was wearing that lovely yellow one with the... I spotted the glowing from her horn, so very soft, and the bottle floating nearby, surrounded in the same light. She was drunk. Of course, she was drunk. That's how she always protected herself against whatever crisis she thought she was going through. And this had been a real one. Still, she was alive. Alive, and exactly the same. I was right here. Again. Mom? Suddenly, Velvet Remedy was between us, with a hoof, and she striked my mother across the face so hard it knocked her down. I stared. Velvet Remedy had just hit my mother. Velvet's voice sounded like she was throwing all the hurt and rage in her behind it. It wasn't a scream, but it was somehow much louder than that. You have suffered nothing. She turned from my wide-eyed mother and lowered her head, pushing me away. There are no thanks which are enough for your bravery and heroism, the Overmare told us, thanking us yet again for coming to Stable 2's rescue. And little Pip, I owe you such an apology. You are always welcome here. This is your home. I looked up at the Overmare, then down on my body. I was caked in blood, maybe half of it mine. No. No? asked the Overmare. I have no place here. Not anymore. I looked up to Velvet Remedy, who was laying on a couch in the Overmare's office, across from me. I've been outside for five weeks, and look at me. As much as I try, 
I'm not the same pony I was when I left. And I never can be. The wasteland has changed me. Bloodied me. Maybe even poisoned me. Like it has everything else outside. I can't come back. I can't bring that poison here. I think it's already gotten in. The Overmere said sadly. I nodded. I know. But these ponies are good ponies. Innocent ponies. They need to treasure that and hold it as long as they can. You need to wash away the blood, clean away the bodies. Try to make Stable 2 right again. Tonight will be enough of a nightmare already. The Overmere nodded. Then, is there anything I can do for you in return for all you've done for us? I thought about it, and looked into her eyes. Yes. First, we need to arrange some sort of payment for the Griffins. Payment? The Overman blinked. Ah, I see. They are mercenaries. Mercenaries who came to Stable to his aid without contract or promise of payment. Velvet Remedy added swiftly, because they trusted us to do the right thing by them in return. Then, I will not sully your reputation, Velvet Darling, the Overmere turned to me. And, was there something else? Yes. I want access to the Overmere's records. That, she did balk at. I want to look at the population records, nothing more. Somehow, she liked this even less. I do as well, Velvet Remedy said, getting up and moving to my side. I was still conflicted, waiting to simultaneously hug her and buck her for striking my mother. You know, the Overmare said slowly, addressing Velvet, when I gave Sweetie Belle's possessions to look through, I was with the hopes that her rich history as a musician would persuade you to accept your career. I hadn't expected you to use them as the opportunity to find escape. She frowned. CMC3, BFF. Clearly, I needed to give you the recordings of a previous Overmare, a much closer inspection before allowing them into Oni Pony Elsa's hooves. Velvet Remedy shook her head. You had to have known. I may have suspected but I thought you would make the better choice. I did make the better choice, Velvet Remedy said firmly. I found what I was looking for in the population records. Within the first few minutes, she made it. Applejack made it into Stable 2. She was here when the stable door sealed. According to the records, she lived peacefully for another 25 years. Happy. Or, at least as happy as some pony could be, living in a stable, and knowing the world above had been completely obliterated. Still, she had survived. According to the records, she spent 10 years down here, bucking the stable's apple orchard, until a hip injury forced her to retire. The doctor's addendum suggested that weakening hips might have been a genetic ailment common to her family. Even after that, she spent another ten cooking for the stable's inhabitants from the kitchen of what was now the Stable 2 saloon. She passed away peacefully, and unlike other stable residents who were incinerated, the Overmere insisted that she be buried in the apple orchard. She was... I paused in my reading. I walked into Pallet's stall. The always messy, paint-slotched artist of Stable 2 had survived the slaughter and was already diving into a new project. The Steel Ranger stood in front of her, obediently at attention, as she painted over the symbol of magical sparks and gears with three candy-red apples. Steel Hoose plotted up to me. I am no longer fit to wear Steel Ranger's armor, but I can't take it off. He said, as I took his new, took in his new look. The ranger had been painted. He too had the Steel Ranger's symbol painted over, with the likeness of Applejack's cutie mark. The red paint continued from there, accenting the ridges and edges 
all over the rest of his armor. So, I thought this would be appropriate. I was a little surprised he didn't go with orange, but I could see that sticking with the cutie marks color. They're all doing it? I asked, looking at the Steel Ranger being painted, and then the line down the hall. Every pony who's decided to return to the true meaning of the oath, that is, the oath as Applejack, would have wanted it, he whined. We won't be able to call ourselves Steel Rangers anymore. I won't be able to, he grumbled. That's going to take some getting used to. What will you call yourselves, then? I suggested. Applejack's Rangers? Hmm. I'm hardly worthy of that. But, maybe. We will see. For now, we are simply outcasts. He looked away his metal-sheathed tail swinging. I have to go for a little bit. I'm taking the others to the Stable 29. I've been in contact with the Star Paladin Crossroads, and she immediately joined the cause. She's already planning to take out uh, to make Stable 29 into some place we can operate out of. All it needs is a functioning water talisman. But there's another problem. Elder Cottage Cheese? As Calamity would say, uh, yep. Steel is nickered. Looks like you were right about him. Cross said he sent a squad of Steel Rangers into the Canterlot Ruins to retrieve that black book for him. But they haven't returned yet. If we can get to Stable 29 before they do, you have a ride. Did you really think Calamity can haul ten more Steel Ranger outcasts all the way to Fetlock? It's a passenger wagon, I commented. Besides, have you met us? Still has laughed. All right, but after you drop us off, you need to head on to Ten Pony Tower. No more delays. I'll catch up to you later, I promise. I nodded, solemnly. I was going to hold him to that. I started to walk away, and then remembered what had caused me to seek him out. Steel Hooves? We need to talk somewhere private. Applejack didn't leave you. Steel Hooves took, shook his head. Yes, she did. She chose to be with her family, and I don't blame her for that. I never have. He paced a little. We weren't exactly. Our relationship was in a bad place. We were trying to put it back together, but it really wasn't going to work, and we both knew it. I loved her, and I let her go. I whimpered inside, but stood firm. No, Applesnack, I said, using his real name. She loved you. She tried to come back to you, but the Overmare wouldn't let her. He stopped, pacing, and looked at me. Wouldn't let her. She helped her family into the stable, and the Overmare closed the door. Applejack didn't know that the Stable 2's Overmare was under strict orders not to open the door for anyone, under any circumstances. Not until the atmospheric and soil monitors read that the world above was clean and safe again. It's been 200 years. I know. Stable Tech grossly miscalculated how long it would take. But that didn't matter, because there was no way Sweetie Belle was going to let Applejack out. Applejack wanted to leave. She wanted to find you. The record for Applejack is full of annotations about her arguments with Sweetie Belle over this. But of course, with her condition, and the readings outside, there was no way Sweetie Belle was going to let her back out. Seelhu stopped. Wait! Her condition? Was she hurt? If those zebras... I could feel my heart sink. Oh, goddesses. He didn't know. Steel hooves, I said, my voice sounding tender and small in my own ears. Applejack was pregnant.
I swear. Have you ever hoffed? This is why I don't want you becoming a medical pony. Velvet Remedy glared at her crossly. You just can't help yourself. You dig and pry. You and little Pip are a match, you know. Velvet Remedy took a deep breath. You have a serious problem here. Have you looked at the population reports? Do you have any idea how many of the original inhabitants of the stable were extended members of the Apple family? By Celestia, even little Pip and I have common Apple ancestry six generations back. I stopped just inside the Overmare's office, watching the two mares argue. Neither of them noticed me. It's not a big deal. Six generations is a lot. This entire stable is in danger of becoming a completely inbred Velvet Remedy shot back. I'd say that's a big deal. Little Pip was wrong. You can't stay locked up in here for much longer. Hello? I said finally. The two mares turned and looked at me with matchingly shocked expressions. Maybe there's another way. One last detour. It was a small one. Fast. Fifteen minutes tops. We'd be back to pick up the Steel Ranger outcasts and ferry them to Fetlock before they knew it. And then it was on to Pony Ten Pony Tower. I needed homage. I needed to just fall to pieces in her embrace. I found one. Velvet Remedy read the words, scrawled in full like letters on the side of the metal monster rusting in front of us. It was a cannon. And it had probably been rusting here for years, even before the war. The goddesses only knew what I had been doing in this secluded portion of Sweet Apple Acres. The trees here grew, grew close. The cannon would have only been visible to a pegasus flying almost directly overhead. And it certainly didn't seem pointed at any place strategic. Small patches of the old metal muzzle were still polished enough to reflect the orange light of the rising sun. The base was partially sunken into the ground, almost uh, amongst several large rocks, making the weapon cant strangely. Nearby was a crumbling picnic table. There were a few planks of wood nailed to a dead tree behind me. How would this have helped? Zenith asked Calamity. I had to admit, I was asking the same question. This old metal monster couldn't possibly fire. Calamity chuckled. Not the cannon. He trotted around the pile of large stones at the base, and was the base was particularly leaning against. He tapped his hoof on the rock, and then another one. This one. A rock? I asked. The Rock of Destiny, our Pegasus friend says, grinning cryptically. I was tired, physically and mentally exhausted. I couldn't keep up. Destiny is a rock? Even Velvet Remedy was looking confused. Clemity sighed. Hollowed out rock, he explained. This rock has been used by every Dashite since the first Pegasus was hunted down by the Enclave and branded for leaving. It's enchanted to open only for some pony who's done know the proper passphrase. He looked down at the apparently special rock. Every Dashite has put something in here, some token of the life they left behind. How did a Pegasus enchant a rock? Veldremedy asked. Clamity shrugged. Well, I assume she met some pony and had someone else do it for her. Or, perhaps a zebra helped her, Zenith offered. Clamity took a deep breath, tapped the rock against his hoof, and said loudly and clearly, Cutie marks don't matter. Footnote, level up. Side note. Firearms has reached 100%. New perk, Zebra Augmented Pony. You have allowed your body to be permanently enhanced through Zebra Alchemy. You gain plus 10% to your poison, fire, and radiation resistances. 
and plus three to your damage threshold. Note, Zebra Augmented Pony and the Cybernetic Implant perk, Cyber Pony, are mutually exclusive.